going to uh, continue in that passage of Scripture. Now, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 and following, we're not going to be there primarily this morning, but in Hebrews 6, uh, verses 9 through 12, but in Hebrews 5, 11 and following, uh, the writer introduces the idea that those who have received mature gospel instruction and have received that for some time have now regressed into spiritual infancy. They've regressed into spiritual infancy. They have, through dullness of hearing, experienced a decline in their spiritual discernment, which is to know good from evil, right from wrong. And because of that, they've started making all kinds of concessions with the world that they should not be making. And they're in danger of kind of reverting back to a system of Judaic worship that has as its fulfillment Jesus. And so he's saying don't don't revert back into those old forms because Jesus, the fulfillment of those forms, is here. Now because of this regression, the writer issues a very stiff uh, and rather terrifying warning in chapter 6. I mean, we could go through and <laughs> read that passage and then read another one like it in Hebrews 10, which is, uh, well, he puts the fear in you. I mean, he, he talks about what it is for people to fall away from the faith and what would be experienced by those who fall away. And he basically says what's going to be experienced there is, is, is damnation. There is going to be no return for those people. And so he's given this very stiff warning. So this whole section of Scripture, starting in chapter 11, or verse 11 of chapter 5, is a wake-up call to those who are dull of hearing. And I think it's, uh, it's easy for any, any of us at different times in our lives to grow dull, to, to be sluggish, to not be paying good attention, to not really care so much what the Word of God says has to say and so he issues this wake-up call uh, so that dullness would be shattered and a return to vibrant persevering faith uh, would be the result so since late September we entered into this rather uncomfortable time of looking at this warning passage which caused us to think about a great many things and we had to consider the genuineness of our faith and to hear clearly the warnings about dullness and wake up. So over the past six weeks, my hope is that, that, that we would wake up. So for those of you who have been hearing these messages over the past six weeks, can I just ask you, has anything in you been awakened? Has there been a vibrancy of sorts that is returning? Praise God who has accomplished that. I got to be a, a, a tiny tool uh, in, in doing what he wanted to do, and I'm thankful that some of you have awakened uh, and that we are growing more and more aware of our situation of dullness and that we want to awaken out of that. Now, last week, we heard the writer's confidence towards this group of people. So he, takes his, he has this whole passage of Scripture where he warns them about dullness, about the dangers that can come, the danger of judgment for those who grow dull in the faith and continue in that way until death. And he says that judgment is coming. And so he, he's given this very stiff warning, but then he says to the people that he's addressing, but I'm convinced of better things for you. When I think of you, he says, I just believe with all my heart that you're going to wake up, that dullness will be shattered, that you will repent and believe afresh the amazing gospel of Jesus Christ, that vibrancy will be restored, and that you'll begin to run again. That, that's his confidence towards this group of people. He was confident that the warnings that he'd given would have their intended results that they'd wake up. Their intended results that persevering faith would be granted and they would run hard. Um, I have this same confidence about you. I have this same confidence about you. When I think about 
uh, those of you that I have known and have watched you run for some time in the faith, I have the same kind of confidence for, uh, about you. I believe that you're, you're waking up, you're going to wake up, that God's going to restore vibrancy, that there's going to be a deep, sustaining, and persevering faith in your lives. I just believe that. I've gotten to know you, and I remember some of the former times in the kind of faith and service to the Lord and love for the saints. I got to see some of that, and so I'm convinced that you are indeed the elect of God and that you are running hard after him, and that if you're not, you'll return to that. I want this more for you than anything. This was our writer's confidence, and so it's mine. So let's read now Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse Nine. This is basically, um, we'll look at the second half of this text for the most part. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. <laughs> he says, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the same, or, I'm sorry, we'll read that again because I was starting with the wrong emphasis. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit, inherit the promises. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning because we need your help to understand these things. If we are left to our own natural mind, you tell us in your word that we can't grasp this. So we ask for your help. We don't want to fall on our own gifts and talents or our own intellect this morning to try to decipher this, to figure it out, to understand the code. Instead, God, we would submit ourselves to your spirit and ask that you would fill us with your spirit. Fill me, Father God, so that I can declare it well and explain it well. Fill your people this morning so that they might hear it, dissect it, understand it, and apply it in the way that you see fit. So help us, Father God, because we cannot help ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. So he says in verse 9, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. So after the warnings, the writer is convinced that rather than falling away from the faith, which is spoken of in Hebrews 6, rather than falling away from the faith through continued dullness, these people will respond with persevering faith. Then in verse 10, we are told that in keeping with the covenant relationship, God does not forget the good work that is done in his name. So he says God is not unjust. He doesn't forget. He remembers the good work that you do. It's good to know, isn't it, that God sees and knows. When we put our hand to the plow and we push hard with all of our might and we surrender ourselves to his desires and his passion for us and, and we, we, we give ourselves up wholly to him and we work for his name, it's good to know that he sees, that he knows, he takes note of these things. He does not forget. In his justice, the Bible says, he releases conditional blessings for those in the covenant that was begun unconditionally. We're in the covenant because Jesus Christ secured our spot there. He, he held your place in line. Okay? But within that unconditional covenant, there are blessings that get conditionally released. We used a verse last week to demonstrate that. Uh, James chapter 5 verse 8 says uh, that um, uh, um, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, so when we're prideful and we're leaning on our own strength and thinking we can do our own thing, uh, even though we're inside the covenant, God's resistance is there, and yet when we are submitting to him, leaning into his strength, despairing of our own resources, but saying, God, you've got to do this, then, then he blesses that. His favor is released in that way. All right, so 
this kind of catches us up to where we're at in the text this week. And we return to verse 10 so that we can do some work in considering the work that God blesses. We just kind of briefly alluded to it last week. We briefly alluded to it last week. And so we want to remember what kind of work is it that God remembers and blesses. We're told that he doesn't forget their love for God's name through their service to each other. That's what it says in in verse 10. Now, I want you to hold on to this idea for just a minute while I demonstrate some things from the text. Hold on to the idea that there is work that God remembers. Okay? There is work that God remembers. Now, in the messages concerning the warning in Hebrews 6, 1 and following, okay, that we preached several weeks ago. Uh, We also read a text from Hebrews chapter 10, okay, um, verses 26 and following, which also another stiff, very solemn warning passage in the Scripture. And uh, um, what I want you to see is the verse that comes, the text that comes after this. The text that comes after that passage in 10 where he issues that warning. So in verse 32, chapter 10, verse 32, he's just finished up with this great warning, and then he says, But recall the former days, when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you, this is weird, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Since you knew that you had a better possession and one that abides. You could look at what you have here and joyfully watch the plundering and seizing of your own property because you realize you weren't made for here. You weren't made for here. He continues, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. So, this text comes after this great warning passage in Hebrews 10. In Hebrews 6, We're looking at this great confidence the writer has in these people because he says, God's going to remember your your good work. So I think what we have in this passage is a description of the good work. He tells us what kind of good work was accomplished by these people. So I think he's, um, he's showing us what this work was and understand, he's trying to help us to understand the kind of gospel culture that produced it. So I want to take just a few minutes to examine what this must have looked like in this early Christian church and what it should look like for us. Now, there's a context where the gospel uh, is at the functional center of people's lives. That's the context he's referring to here in Hebrews chapter 10. These people lived in such a way that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ were at the functional center of their lives. And what that means is the way that they talked, the things that they did, the way they comported themselves, the way they behaved, all tied back to the work they understood Jesus accomplishing through his life and what he accomplished through his death and the power that gets released through his resurrection. So there's, it's at a functional center. They don't just simply say things like, oh, sure, we believe the gospel. They could say, in effect, we live out the implications of the gospel. We are dwelling in the gospel. And this culture was governing their lives at the functional center of their lives. The way they related to their persecutors and the way they related to each other were so fashioned by the gospel that when things went very, very badly, when the press of suffering came in, they didn't leak patterns of sin. Instead, they leaked joy. 
Now, when I think about the church, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of ways to think about the church. So I know this could be reductionistic or simplistic in one way. But when I think about the church, one of the ways I think about it is we are like a Petri dish where a lot of unhealthy organisms get dropped into that Petri dish to kind of rub on each other and bang off of each other and irritate each other and vex each other at times. You see, that's what I think about the church. The church is a place where unhealthy, dysfunctional organisms leak out their dysfunction on everybody around them. And the only way that context doesn't erupt into pettiness and jealousy and strife and disunity of every imaginable kind. The only way it doesn't disrupt into that or or evolve into that is if the gospel of Jesus Christ governs the way that all of those dysfunctional, unhealthy people relate to each other. The only way the journey can exist in the form that it does where we can halfway love each other part of the time is if the gospel of Jesus Christ is at work in us. So this is a group of people that have been living together, banging off of each other, rubbing up against each other, irritating each other, And then when the press of suffering came, I'm sure there's dysfunction along with it, but what we see as the dominant characteristic that our author remembers is joy. How in the world does that happen? They start leaking joy in righteous living. Not petty, not infantile, not discouraged, not discomforted, but courageous, brave, and heroically loving. The only way that happens in a group of people who are sinful and dysfunctional is if the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ develops our culture at the very core of who we are. It's the only way it happens. It's the only way... It happens. These people, the text says, they endured suffering. They were publicly exposed to reproach, which means that they were mocked. They were humiliated. They were disregarded and exposed to affliction. We can imagine that was probably physical, probably financial, probably emotional, relational. I mean, imagine when you became a Christian and the people in your own biological family disowned you and said, that dude's crazy, he's none of us anymore. This is what these people are suffering. They experienced the seizure of their property. I I don't know how we would respond if somebody came and took our stuff. I don't know that joy would be the way we would respond. Can we just be honest here for a minute? But all of this was met with joy from these afflicted Christians. Now let me just say, in all of my years in ministry, I haven't seen much of this kind of ill treatment at the hands of the culture. Now, I'm not saying that the culture loves Christianity. In in fact, it increasingly is more and more hostile to Christianity, right? We we, we see that in our news feed on Facebook almost every day. Some (laughs) government act, some court, some whatever is issuing these different laws and regulations, etc., that that seem to be narrowing the church in, hemming the church in into a a corner, if you will. People are uh, treating Christians... Uh, less and less respectfully as the years go by. But I think we can say, by and large, we don't see the kind of treatment they suffered yet. Right? You agree with that? We don't see the kind of treatment that they suffer yet. Um, so how is this text then relevant for us? Because he, he says, God's not going to forget your good work that you do in the, your love and service to the saints. 
the way you love God's name and the way you serve each other. Um, he's not going to forget it. Here's what the work look, that look, looked like, the suffering, persecution, seizure of property, um, reproached and humiliated and these kinds of things. So how's this relevant to us if we don't live in that kind of context of um, persecution? Well, in my humble opinion, to those who are living in a more privileged age, which we are, okay, I think the application is clear. Here's the question we need to ask and a number of questions that flow from that. How are we living in relation to each other and those outside the faith during this time of relative ease. How are we living in relation to each other and those outside the faith during this time of relative ease? If the gospel is not at the actual center of our lives now, should we expect it to be at the functional center of our lives when persecution comes? I would say no. I would say no. If we're not living with Christ as our functional center now, then we won't be living that way when persecution comes. So, are we living now in such a way that the gospel is the actual center of our lives? And if not, how do we begin to work on that? Now, I know it may sound like a very lofty ideal to consider. Is the gospel at the functional center of my life? It may seem like a lofty idea. It may seem very, very subjective to you. But I think that it's not subjective at all. It has a, has a sort of metrics to it by which we can discern our le- level of functional gospel centrality. I want to give you some good questions to ask this morning. We'll give you some tools, okay? Some good questions to ask to evaluate how central the gospel is in your life. You won't like the questions. I'm sorry. Um, I don't like them either. Um. These questions, and this is what the important thing, I didn't arbitrarily come up with these questions. These questions trace their origins to how Jesus acted in his life and in his death and what he has secured through that work. They trace their origins back there. So they're practical gospel centrality questions. And they're first applied to our relationships with each other because this is a place, or should be a place at least, right, for us to safely practice the gospel in relationships. This should be the place where we can safely do that. Uh, we, I know, yeah, it's going to be awkward for us to speak the truth to one another in love and us to, to live in this kind of gospel uh, culture with each other. But at least this is, there's some safety here. But then it also applies to how we relate to those people outside of the church, those people who aren't Christians, or who at least are mere professors, it, relate, it tells us how we should relate to them as well. Now, before you get offended at any of the questions, before you get offended at any of the questions, know this. Jesus dealt very, very clearly with each of these things in his teachings. He dealt very clearly with each of these things in his teachings. In fact, I, could, I think we could say that these things uh, make up a majority of his teachings. They're metrics of our love for God and our love for others. So here's the questions. You ready? First one. How do I respond when I am wronged or perceive that I am wronged? We know that perception and reality can be two different things, right? Okay. But my perception makes it pretty real for me. Makes it pretty real for you when you perceive one thing or another. How do you respond when you're wronged or perceive that you're wronged? This might not be uh, receiving what you think you should receive from someone. It might not feel like you, you've been given what you deserve. How do you respond when you don't get what you think you deserve from the hands of other people? How do you respond when you're slighted? Seems like you're left out in one way or another. Another thing about that Petri dish that's interesting, when I think about all those dysfunctions and one of the reasons why we react in the Petri dish the way that we do is because we're insecure and anxious. We're insecure and anxious. I can perceive by the way that you act that it says something about me. 
We, we live out our insecurities, we live out our anxieties continually. And so when we're wronged, our insecurities and our anxieties come to the very top of things, don't they? And we have to respond to those things in a gospel way or particular things that aren't very good begin to take place in our hearts. And they begin to run throughout our hearts uh, carving out things that shouldn't be carved out. How do you respond uh, when you are actively being sinned against? Maybe just feeling like somebody doesn't like you. How do we respond? Do we think through the story of the gospel and how Jesus responded to people who hated him? All of us were, the Bible says, hostile in our minds, engaged in evil deeds. And what did he do? He left the glory of heaven to come save us. How do we respond when we think we are wronged or perceive that we're wronged? Do you absorb the wrong, covering it with love? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, love covers a multitude of sins. He's quoting Proverbs from the Old Testament. Do we absorb the wrong, covering it with love, and refuse to allow the hurt to settle in us? What happens when the hurt settles? We know, don't we? It goes sideways. It goes ugly. It begins to create, we, I, we, have, we think different kinds of illusions, if you will. We're deceived in our own mind. This is what the Bible says when it talks about the human heart in Jeremiah 17, 9, when he says uh, the heart is deceitful above all else. When you are wronged and you, or you, are, you perceive you are wrong, you will come up with ideas in your mind about why they did it and what they intended and what they meant. That's what we do, right? That's what happens when the hurt settles in me when it interacts with my anxieties, and when it interacts with my insecurities, my dysfunctions as an individual. So do I absorb the wrong? Do I give the benefit of the doubt, refusing to let a slight become an issue, robbing me of joy as I relate to other people? Or do I become resentful, jealous, envious, covetous, and bitter? We all know what it's like to go there, don't we? I've been there, lived there for weeks, months at a time, maybe years, who knows. These things, resentfulness, jealousy, envious, these things, they work themselves out. In fact, the Bible actually says about bitterness that see to it that a root of bitterness doesn't spring up in you. He said, and by it, many be defiled. It gets wide fast. Bitterness gets wide fast. It doesn't just stay localized in you. It begins to infect and corrupt the things and the people around you. This church, because they were joyfully accepting the seizure of their property and being publicly humiliated as the church of Jesus Christ, what is clear to me is that at this point in time and in years before, they had been refusing to allow these things to set up in their hearts. They were doing gospel work, dealing with these things. There was no, divi- we don't read of divisions in this church. Read, read Hebrews from cover to cover. It's not a group that was divided. Gossip and slander wasn't alive in their church. The second question, second metric question, if you will. How do I relate to my neighbors, coworkers, friends, etc.? And here's what I mean by that. Are you relating to these people actively with gospel intentionality or passively with little to no interaction? Are you, are you relating to the people in your life, neighbors, friends, co-workers, family? Are you, are you relating to them actively with gospel intentionality or passively? 
with little to no interaction with them on a gospel level at all. Is the gospel's reach through your life a prominent ideal? Do you think about yourself as a missionary that God has planted where you are at to reach the people around you with the good news of Jesus Christ? Do you think that way? Do you think that way about the people who are next to you in the, cu- in the cubicles around you, uh, in the office space next to you, in the house next door? Are you living this out? I'm watching in many of your lives and I'm aware of many of the stories of how many of you are living proactively. Gospel intentionality is clearly seen in the way that you relate to the people around you. And I'm so encouraged and praising God and thanking him for it. Is this the way you are living towards these people? As if the gospel's reach is a prominent ideal in your life. Or are you living in such a way so as not to offend or create awkwardness of any kind And so there is little to no gospel intentionality in your life. And I mean this in regards to those people in your life who are Christians and those people in your life who are non-Christians. Because the Bible says, as far as the way we relate to one another, we're supposed to speak the truth to one another in love. It says that we are supposed to be engaged and involved with each other. That's the reason that community is such a big idea here at The Journey, because we believe that we have to live in the context of continual counseling with each other are you living with gospel intentionality towards christians in your life and non-christians in your life if you are not living with gospel intentionality in your relationships with those inside the church and those without the church then you are not a gospel-centered person in that regard I'm not going to say not, not gospel-centered in any way, but in that regard, which we have to admit, right, is a pretty big regard, because Jesus gave us how many missions? One mission. Make disciples. The mission that we've been given is very, very clear, and the mission is to relate with gospel intentionality. Okay, third question. We like these questions less. How do I live in relation to my possessions? Right, the text talks about it. These people joyfully accepted the seizure of their property. How do we live in relation to possessions? Do you live like they are yours? To be used for your continued and heightened comfort? Or do you live like they are God's? to use in such a way that his purposes are advanced by my stewardship of these things? Do I live with the things that I have as if these things are given to me by God so that I can advance his purposes in the way that I use them? I don't think it's wrong for Christians to have nice houses. Don't think it's wrong for Christians to have nice cars. Don't think it's wrong for Christians to have pools in the backyard. I have one. Jose has one. Some of you have them. There are things that we do, and we, there are uh, enjoyments that we have in this life. And I have no problem with Christians enjoying many of these things. But do we enjoy it as if it terminates on our comfort and our pleasure Or is it a good thing to be used for the advancement of God's purposes? That's the question. It's not wrong for someone to have lots of stuff. So long as they're using the stuff to advance God's kingdom agenda. Not their own comfort. I get the feeling from some people, I really, really do, that they think that their home is theirs to use as they please and only. I don't have to invite anybody into my home. Don't have to, don't have to open my home. Don't have, to, don't have to be hospitable. I'll tell you what that is, folks. That's sin. It's sin to live with your stuff 
as if it's yours to use how you want and God's kingdom doesn't have any bearing on it? That, I'll tell you what, it's idolatry. It's idolatry. Do we really think, when you think about, th- think about your home for just a minute, do we really think, because for most of us, our home is probably the biggest possession we have? Probably that would be true for most of us, right? Our home is, is it's the biggest thing that we have. Do we think that God would look at the very biggest thing he's given us and go, well, that's off limits to me. I know that's your thing. You get to use it however you want to. You enjoy that. Um, you, and and I, won't, I won't step into that. We know better than that. Okay, last question. And I'm sure you knew I was going here. How do I live in relation to money? How do I live in relation to money? Do I use it like it's mine to use it my discretion or like it's God's to use in such a way that his purposes are seen as preeminent in the way I use it? I love what John Piper talks, when he he talks about money, he says God's given us money so that we can prove by the way we use it that it's not our God. How are you using money? Are you generous as God blesses? Or do you hold on tight-fisted? Only giving what seems to be absolutely required I think it's one of the reasons why the the tithe is not more prominently talked about in the New Testament. I don't think necessarily that the tithe is just kaput and and, and there's nothing to it. I think grace giving always goes way beyond, way beyond. I think it's always just a starting place. But I think one of the reasons why it's not uh, more prominently talked about is because God expects a kind of generosity from us that would far overflow the boundaries of a tithe in the way that we give to God's work. And I'm not even saying, I'm not even trying to hone that down and say you have to give all 10% to the church or whatever you give to the church. No, just live generously as Christians, pouring out as it's poured in. These are just a few questions. And these things, the way we live in regards to these questions, has a lot to do with how we will live when some of it gets taken away. How could these people joyfully embrace the the, the seizure of their property? They knew it wasn't theirs. They never lived like it was theirs. They'd long since given up any kind of notion that what I have is for me. They even saw their bodies like that. What I have, my body, it's not even for me. It's why the men in Acts, after they were beaten nearly to death, could walk home, the Bible says, praising God that they'd been considered worthy to suffer for the name. Body wasn't theirs. And so if the body gets beaten, we can count it all as joy, brothers, when we encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When your house gets seized and taken away, you lack nothing. This is the good work that God will not forget. The way we live in relation to these questions, the way we relate to each other, are we forgiving and kind and generous? Are we these things? This is what had so formed these people. This was a gospel culture. It wasn't a culture of ownership. It was a a culture of stewardship in relation to everything in their lives. These are just a few questions I think you could probably think of more. The point is this. We're not being persecuted yet. We're not suffering affliction as a church for the name of Jesus yet. 
we have the opportunity now to practice what a gospel culture looks like in the way we relate to each other and the way we relate to those outside the church so that when persecution comes, we'll be ready. When they take our stuff, we can rejoice. If we won't forgive each other when wronged now, if we won't live with gospel intentionality and everything now, if we won't share our possessions and give generously now, I assure you we will not do it when affliction comes. Living out the storyline of the gospel is for right now. Okay? I think we have to get ready. More and more persecution is coming. So I'm asking you, use questions like this as metrics. They're not questions I devised. I think we would all agree, right? Jesus taught a lot about all of those things, didn't he? Yeah, I didn't make anything up here. So let's use these questions. Now let's move on in the text. Verse 11. Verse 11 of chapter 6. Verse 11 of chapter 6. He says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. The writer expresses his cohort's desire, the group of people who are with him. He says, it's our desire, it's our passion to see each and every one of you. No, he says, each one of you. He's not referring collectively to the church. He says, I want to see each one of you show the same earnestness earnestness for assurance William Lane who is a trusted commentator on Hebrews I've used him a lot um, way better mind than mine uh, he, he said this about this verse he says what this implies is the ability to translate Christian conviction into action that will express the quality of hope that distinguishes the church from other contemporary clubs and societies. Our writer desperately wants for these people to show an earnestness about their assurance of hope. This means that the activity and behavior of the church should convey a radically different type of culture. A culture formed by the gospel. Not a culture of pettiness, unforgiveness, gossip, resentment, jealousy, envy, strife, greed, idolatry, and possessiveness. But instead a culture of generosity, of forgiveness, of edifying speech, of trust, and unity. How beautiful is unity. I want to contend that it's this kind of culture in which assurance is to be had. I do not believe that God intends for a Christian to have assurance of salvation if the pursuit of assurance through following Jesus is not evident in their life. I think that this text as well as others demonstrates that. The word, interestingly enough, the word for earnestness in the Greek here literally means to do one's best. To do one's best. Now we know that it doesn't depend on our strength to do it. God himself with his inexhaustible riches of strength will supply us all that we need to do our best. We know also that we're not doing our best to win God's favor but because we already have it. He has loved us in Jesus Christ when we were yet sinners. But we are wrong. We are wrong, wrong, wrong if we believe that the gospel is opposed to doing one's best. Dallas Willard, uh, a theologian who died several years ago, says the gospel is not opposed to effort, but rather it is opposed to earning. The gospel is not opposed to working hard. It's not opposed to bringing your best. It's not opposed to... to to doing good work, the gospel is opposed to the mentality that says, I've done good work, therefore you owe me something. 
That's what the gospel is diametrically opposed to. We don't have God over a barrel, him owing us because of the good work that we do. Owing us salvation, owing us an eternity with him. Absolutely not. But the assurance here mentioned is pursued. That's the the real point of this verse. The the assurance mentioned is pursued. This is for those who are inside the covenant that was secured by Jesus. Pursue assurance. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 tells us to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness that without which, or sorry, without which no one will see the Lord. He says strive after it. Strive. Pursue. Run. What does that mean? What does strive mean? I think it means the same thing that Jesus said to the first of his disciples. He said, come, follow me. Come, follow me. This in no way can be understood as have faith, and I will drag you along behind me as I go. It can't be understood that way. We do violence to the text. And, and a lot of people are doing all kinds of theological What's it called when people bend and twist? and Gymnastics. People are, people are doing all this twisting with the text to try to edit work out entirely. Work is to be edited out in the sense that we do not contribute to our salvation one iota. None. Absolutely nothing. Jesus did it all. But inside the covenant of grace... We are working, putting our hands to the plow and pushing. We are called to do the good work of the gospel. Not so that we can save ourselves or keep our salvation. Jesus did all of that. But we are to come and follow Jesus. The writer says, it's his great desire that their earnest pursuit of assurance carries them all the way to the end. And their assurance, the Bible says, is an assurance of hope. And this isn't hope like I hope it will rain next week. This is hope. This hope hope is our fixed confidence that Jesus has secured our salvation through his work in his life and in his death. That's my hope. I know, proof positive, that he finished my salvation. I know it. So pursue it. Pursue it. Pursue the assurance of it. If that sounds paradoxical to you, then good. It sounds a little paradoxical to me too. The older I get, the more I'm making peace with it. The Bible says rest in Christ's finished work and follow Christ through the power of his finished work. Not either or, both. Both. I don't have to work out all the intellectual difficulties with that. I have enough information to know that Jesus has saved me, is saving me, and will save me. And all of that happens through the continued application of his finished work. Now, it's crucial, absolutely critical, that we understand the application of his finished work in such a way that it's changing us. Romans 8, 29 says that we are are predestined by God to be conformed to the image of his son. It means he's predestined us for change. Predestined us for change. Overcoming our pettiness and how we often relate to one another. Overcoming our resentment with each other. Jesus continually dealt with these things with his very own disciples. Remember at the table there at the very end, just before he would be arrested, they, a fight breaks out at the table after communion about who's the greatest? Overcoming my tenacious hold on my stuff like it's for my comfort. Overcoming my greedy hold on my money like it's for my pleasure. Simply overcoming my love for the world and its offerings of idolatry. 
it's producing a kind of work in us that the Bible says God doesn't forget. He doesn't forget it. He takes note of these things. Now look at verse 12 and let's see what happens. We'll go very quickly here. Verse 12. He says, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now at first reading, you may not be struck by the significance of this text. This verse, though, is the end of a giant parenthesis of thought that begins all the way back in chapter 5, verse 11. Because he uses the same word, and every commentator agrees that this is, because the writer of Hebrews, it, it's the most polished Greek in the whole Bible. This is excellent. This guy was a literary genius in the way that he composed the book. And every commentator agrees that this was absolutely intentional. In verse 11, he says, you've been dull of hearing. And here he says, you're sluggish. They're the same Greek word. Exact same. Not even a, a letter difference. It's the word nofroi, if you're uh, into the Greek. And, and it simply means dull of hearing, sluggish, lazy, neglecting the word. That's the idea of it. So at the end of this giant parenthesis of thought, he closes up and he says, listen, in the beginning I started this argument by telling you that you are dull of hearing. I've been telling you all of the things through this whole text for you to understand why you're dull of hearing, why your discernment is so badly practiced so that you can wake up and break out of this. And he closes his argument by saying, do all these things so that you may not be sluggish. He starts with this long warning passage about these people who've become dull of hearing. And then he tells them all the ways that they can be involved and active in God's work in their life so that they will not be dull of hearing. The end of the parenthesis. What's the end of this kind of living? I love this. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now we could spend a long, long time talking about all the promises of God, but suffice it just to Mention one of them. Eternal life with him. Eternal life with him. I encouraged a brother just before this service began. Saying, we're not made for this life. We're not made for this life of death and corruption and decay. We are made for a city whose foundations will never crumble. We are made for a place where there is no more death, sickness, decay, or disease. There is no more sin. We are made for that world. And he says, live this out. Come, run hard with us. Follow after Jesus so that we can inherit the promises made in Jesus Christ. Primarily and chiefly that we will be with him forever. When this place is done. So I want you to follow this, this little summary of thought. Because we've spent so long in, since 511. I want you to follow this summary of thought. So that you can get the <laughs> gist of the whole thing. Basically he says you've become dull of hearing the scriptures. And you can't take the meat of it. That's in that first section in 11 through 14 of chapter 5. He says, you got this way from neglecting the scriptures and your discernment is under practice to the point where you've made concessions to the world. If we will not crave the truth about Jesus and live a life in keeping with his truth, then we will be damned. However, I am sure that you will wake up Pursue the full assurance provided by Jesus' work and inherit the promises made in him. May we always remember this 
awesome warning text and the encouragement that it ends with. Let's pray.